This week, a look back at some of our most fascinating historical journeys. From the desert canyons of Jordan, and that would be impressive if we built that today, but that was built thousands of years ago. Look at it. To the noisy streets of Paris. Driving a two-civic car is not easy. Driving in Paris is not easy. <laughs> and from the majesty of Lady Liberty, it stood for freedom and for liberty to people all over the world. To the drama of the Kenyan bush. Welcome to Paris, where I'm soaking up the sun on the banks of the River Seine. It's lovely. Both the left bank and right banks of the River Seine are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The left is famous for inspiring generations of artists and intellectuals, while the right is home to the world's most visited museum, the Louvre. And with all this heritage to soak up here, it's the perfect setting to take an amble down memory lane and revisit some of our favorite historical journeys. And let's begin right here in Paris. In 2018, one of the classics of the French car industry turned 70, and Krista managed to get behind the wheel to give it a spin. I'm definitely gonna need a lesson, Vincent. <laughs> Vincent takes guided tours around Paris. Now, where is the gear stick? The gear stick is there, you know? <laughs> okay. So you just turn that okay. if you want to press the first one. And that pull, way? this pull. is first. Okay, okay, then back to neutral. There. And push, push. second. Second. This is very unusual. Yeah, I know that. It's unique. <laughs> this might take, please, please excuse me if we, if we bunny hop up the street. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Driving a 2CV feels actually very different to any kind of modern car. You can feel the, the engine under your foot, you know, and you're the noise of the car, and uh, it's very physical, and uh, it's not a car that goes very fast, but it's not the goal, you know. It is a, it's a very kind of active experience. Yeah. There's no sitting back and letting the car do its work. You have to be involved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and on the left, this is the Louvre Museum. Is there something, uh, I mean, do you think this is part of French identity? Yes, it is, of course. Yes, with the baguette and with <laughs> the stripes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got two of the three. We'll have to stop for the baguette. Yeah. You're very brave because uh, <laughs> driving a two-civic car is not easy. Driving in Paris is not easy. Driving uh, for the first time a two-civic car in Paris is uh, really, really brave for you. <laughs> there are no airbags, the windows aren't electric, and as for AC, let's just say it's pretty rudimentary. But for some reason, the French really seem to love the two-CV. As long as that remains the case, the car they call the Tin Snail will keep ploughing its own furrow on slow lanes everywhere. Krista there at the wheel of an absolute classic right here in Paris back in 2018. Right, it's time for us to cross over to a completely different part of the world now as we transport you from the brisk northern coastlines of Europe to the dust and the sand of southern Jordan. Petra is one of the world's most famous archaeological sites. Carved out of the desert 2,000 years ago, it was built by a local tribe called the Nabataeans. Well, in 2016, I went to see efforts to protect this ancient site from the elements and from tourists like me. This split in the rocks is called the Seek, and it was the only entrance or way in and out of the city. And it would have been heavily guarded to stop anyone from sneaking in and trying to take over. I mean, it's just breathtaking.
At the end of the Seek is the most famous part of Petra, the treasury, an elaborate temple carved from the sandstone. And just take a look around, you can see how popular this place is. It's the most visited in all of Jordan, but having all of these people here can bring problems. The delicate rocks are easily damaged by tourists touching the monuments or walking off the designated trails, especially in places where excavations are underway. But now there's a project aimed at getting tourists themselves involved with the conservation of the monuments to help protect one of the most threatened sites in the whole of Petra. This is the Temple of Winged Lions, a religious complex built in around 27 AD. I'm liking your office, Glenn. I like what you've done with it. No, it's, this is a beautiful place. This is... Glenn is in charge of the site and tells me how the problems here started in the 1970s when the temple was first excavated. They uncovered this cool monument but didn't do a wonderful job of doing the things necessary to preserve it for future generations. Whenever you excavate a monument, you have to pull a lot of the earth out of the ground in order to reveal it. And so this earlier project dumped a lot of that earth. And so as you'll see, we're trying to re-excavate those earlier archeological dumps. The dumps are huge mounds of compressed earth, which will take years to sort through. At the moment, there's a team of local people tackling this mammoth task. We have specialists who come and actually work and train and work with the local community and not have them just be regular day laborers that sort of help with manual labor, but actually training them in the tangible vocational skills to help them preserve the site in the coming years. And the idea is that the locals then train tourists to help out too. We're going to have them working on the soil dumps, looking for pottery and coins and other things the original excavation missed, to have the experience of actually doing archaeology for a day. Okay, I've got some skills, man. Have you got a digger here or something? Yeah, hey, we're ready to go. Ready? <laughs> Woo! This is an interesting route to get down here. <laughs> so tell me what you're doing. Now we sift most of this sand. Ahmed and Iman both grew up in Petra and have become experts at sorting through the material here. So you're, you're basically sieving out all the dust and looking for the valuable pieces. Yes. Can I have a go? I, I was enjoying tasting the dust, but now Iman shows me the sort of thing they're looking for. Like normal stones, we don't need them. We don't need to kill them. So yeah, that just... doesn't look very valuable, that one. No. <laughs> This is a part of a uh, jar, mm -hmm. and it's Nabati. So that would be the original people who lived here, the Nabati. Yes. So that would be very, very old? Yes. Wow. <laughs> 2,000 years old. 2,000 years old. Let's see if I can find any treasures. OK, stand back. Let the, let the master get to work. Is that cool? Yeah. Let's look. That stone. I'm terrible, I can't find anything. Well, I might not be having much luck, but over the last few years, they've found all sorts here. Painted pottery, coins, lamps, and decorations from the temple. Now, as more pieces are retrieved and catalogued, it's hoped we can learn more about the everyday lives of the people who built this incredible city more than 2,000 years ago. Oh, wow, that brought back some lovely memories of pushing around that ancient city, even though it was a little bit bumpy on my wheels, and imagining what that beautiful place must have looked like all of those years ago. Right. Do not go anywhere because we've got loads more still to come, including the secrets of Lady Liberty and the new museum sitting at her feet. Now for the piece de resistance. The original torch wow. stood up there from 1886 to 1984. And how punk helped bring down the Berlin Wall. 
auch Kids, die nach irgendwas gesucht haben und rebellieren wollten, ihre Freiheit wollten. So make sure you don't go away. Now just behind me is the iconic Notre Dame. Sadly, we can't take you inside because it's still undergoing repairs after that devastating fire back in 2019. So why don't we take you somewhere completely different, like Kenya. We're off on safari in memory of one of history's most famous lions. Elsa was made a star in the movie Born Free, which hit the big screens in 1966. It was based on a book by Joy Adamson about her and her husband George's attempt to rescue an orphaned lion cub and train it for life in the wild. So back in 2015, we sent Henry, our very own Hollywood movie star, to Maroon National Park to find out more. This park is virtually unchanged since George and Joy were here. We've come across a lioness and her cub. They've just feasted, so um, this is the moment where they get really lazy. They've nestled just below a lovely tree for some shade. This kind of reminds me of what Elsa would have been doing here in Meru National Park. George had this lovely call, never had to shout. Just gently call them, boy, boy, hey boy, boy, come boy. Of course, Joy and George needed helpers, and one of those was Johnny Baxendale, George's godson. He helped return the Born Free Lions to the wild, but used to come back out to their favorite haunts for regular visits. You never felt in danger at all? Never. No? They were relaxed, there was no tension, there was no issues. We knew very well that, you know, we, they would walk up to us and greet us in the most amazing way. The pair used to sit under this tamarind tree with warm beers. It doesn't take long for the memories to come flooding back. Just being with him and being able to work with him and, and see how he absolutely handled his lions and how relaxed he was. And he had this amazing rapport with his environment. He was a, totally in harmony with his environment. This is the born free country. This is where it all happened. This is where Elsa was found, and this is where Elsa died. Memories of Elsa the Lion from back in 2015. What cool story that was. Okay, it's time to go from the plains of Africa to the razzmatazz of New York and one old lady who's been watching over the city for well over a century. The Statue of Liberty has dominated New York Harbor since 1886, a gift from the people of France. Well, in 2019, a brand new museum in her honor opened, so Lucy got the early ferry to Liberty Island to be among the first to check it out. There are three primary areas of the museum. Mm -hmm. People come in, they'll go into the immersive theater. Then they'll move on to the engagement gallery, which is where we're standing right now. Mm -hmm. And the engagement gallery is primarily the history of the Statue of Liberty. Um, its beginning and then how it became the symbol of America. And now it's used in every sort of thing that you can think of. In 1885, it was shipped in 350 individual pieces over to New York, where it was reassembled and unveiled to the American public the next year. And then you finish with the Inspiration Gallery. Now for the piece de resistance, the original torch. The torch. The original torch. Wow. Stood up there from 1886. 
to 1984. Talk to me about how difficult it was to get the torch in here. Well, it, I didn't have to do it, <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it was quite a task. Yeah. People worked for about two weeks from three in the afternoon till three at night, and they had this carrier that they laid the face on its back and then put the torch on it, and it all worked quite well, and here it is. Martin and his team have been in charge of conserving the torch and cleaning it up. Well, today is the last day. It's sort of the clean down from the top down. Mm -hmm. And so as they're finishing up the lighting fixtures inside, my job is then the final clean down of everything that falls down. It's just a simple cotton cloth, just trying to get the, the, the heavy things out. Just getting rid of that dirt. You like work with any cleaning yeah. job, it's never just done. Like I think it's really quite impressive just how much detail there is on something that really wasn't designed to be seen close up. You know, just the detail is so intricate. It's, 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 it's pretty amazing how it all comes together, huh? Part to part, piece to piece, and then all of a sudden you've got a torch. <laughs> yeah. It's so iconic, and, and you think about its history and uh, w how it stood for freedom and for liberty mm -hmm. uh, to people all over the world. It really is a, a remarkable piece of work. And the museum is free to all visitors of Liberty Island. Lucy on Liberty Island in 2019. Now that's one of my personal historical highlights on a trip to Germany in that same year. It had been exactly 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The structure that had divided not just the city, but families, nations and superpowers. Stretching over 80 miles, it was built to separate the communist east and the capitalist west. But I was there to find out how, amongst other things, an energetic underground punk scene helped to bring about its demise. Chaos was the front man for Wundtenfell, one of the scene's top bands. Oh, kids, die nach irgendwas gesucht haben und äh, rebellieren wollten, ihre Freiheit wollten, ohne Vorschriften, äh, ohne Regeln. Und hätte mir aber letztendlich nie ausmalen können, was für extreme Konsequenzen das hatte. Im Prinzip alle gegen dich. Die Eltern, die Verwandtschaft, die Gesellschaft. Und die dachten aber auch, wir, denke ich mal, haben vor, das System zu stürzen. East Germany's secret police, the Stasi, regularly targeted defiant anti-authoritarian punks. On multiple occasions, chaos was imprisoned and brutally beaten. Mir dann einen schwarzen Sack über den Kopf gezogen wurde und äh, man hat mich in ein Waldstück gefahren rausgeholt und drei Mann haben mich zusammengetreten. Ich mit Handschellen und ähm, das war ein Moment, wo ich dachte, die bringen mich jetzt um. Es war meine Trotzigkeit, mein, mein unbedingter Wille, mir einfach nichts vorschreiben zu lassen. Back then, the intense scrutiny of the Stasi meant that gigs often had to be held in the unlikeliest of locations. This is the place. Wow, this is pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's a church. <laughs> I can't imagine 
hundreds of punks coming to a church for a concert. Yeah, but hundreds of beer. <laughs> hat nur die Kirche, die einen gewissen Schutz und äh, Räume zur Verfügung gestellt. Es würde einfach zu viel Aufsehen erregen, würde man in einer kirchlichen Einrichtung damals auch schon Leute verhaften, zuführen, äh, prügeln oder sonst was. What was the vibe and the energy like in here? Äh, es war lustig. Einerseits war natürlich eine ganze Menge Punks, die wussten, es ist ein Konzert dort. Aber es waren natürlich auch äh, viele Hippies, Langhaarige und äh, Leute aus der jungen Gemeinde da, inklusive der Facher. Ähm, und ich sag mal, die wussten am Anfang noch nicht, auf was sie sich da einlassen. When you think about those times, those difficult times during the GDR period where you were intimidated by the Stasi and the, the, the problems that you had amongst the people in the streets. Would you do it again? Absolutely. It was for me the hardest, but also the best time. Don't you just love that? History told to us by people who were there actually making things happen. Right, coming up next time, the story of a magnificent mount. Mont Saint-Michel in northern France is celebrating its millennium. I often compare the Mont Saint-Michel as being the jewel and the bay, the box. So that's the jewel and the box, you've got nice. it all. I head there to take a peek behind the scenes and find out how things have changed there in all those years. Until then, you can follow us on social media. We're in all the usual places, along with lots of other great travel content from around the BBC. See you soon. Bye-bye.